Hello, this is the Delicious Legacy Podcast. I'm your host, Thomas Dinas. Join me for another archaeogastronomical adventure where we dive deep into past unknown recipes, ancient dishes, long lost traditional ingredients, and foodstuffs from bygone eras, the forgotten, old, and sometimes not so old, world. On today's bonus episode, I'm exploring somewhat little-known local delicacies from the northern corners of England. Some cheeses and meats and desserts that seem to deserve a lot more limelight than they currently have. These delicacies, these local treasures, are often as complex as you will find in any corner of the earth, but also born of necessity and poverty. The ingenuity of the locals, who put their little grey cells in action to create tasty recipes, from the most humble ingredients utilizing the produce that in our so-called modern world we might consider, well, until uh, recently at least, as a waste. For this, I salute them and celebrate them here on this little bonus episode. Enjoy! Does regional British food exist? Well, I think it does. It is quite difficult to find it these days, but still, there are numerous local, seasonal recipes and ingredients that uh, they appear in a very specific region of UK. If you remember, in season one, many episodes ago, I did um, a little guide about uh, my favourite regional foods of uh, England. And, um, yeah, I think, after many episodes have passed, I think... It's time to revisit uh, the specialties of um, regional English cuisine and Welsh cuisine and Scottish cuisine. But they, yeah, I think I'm going to focus a little bit in the northern uh, part of England, northern food, and just uh, let's celebrate a little bit of um, the local northern food. But in order to find these ingredients and this, um, and this delicious um, regional British food, where do we have to look? Are we looking in the correct place? There are many things that we know already. There are things and recipes that um, they transcendent the boundaries of um, of the specific regions, like the Lancashire hotpot, for example. And and yet there's no magic formula for a tasty, well-made um, hotpot. It's the nature of such dishes that um, it makes the dish, the whole dish itself, greater than the sum of its parts. And um, by diving a little bit deeper into the locality of the ingredients, we can understand why this particular dish has sprung from that particular region and not from somewhere else. Or why there are differences even between regions on very, very similar recipes and ingredients. And um, for example, cheese is one of the best examples we have on that. And we talked many times about cheese on this podcast. And... And yet, you know, cheese is a very basic food and it comes from milk, basically, and some rennet. There's so many different varieties, especially here in Britain, and they all, all taste very different. So it has to do with the breed of the of the cattle or the, sh- the sheep or the goat, for that matter. Uh, the local water, the pasture, the yeasts and the bacteria that they, they live locally in the air, and the techniques that they use to curdle the milk. Every cheese, uh, cheese maker has uh, their own. All these affect uh, the outcome. And one of my favorite um, foodstuffs is cheese, obviously. And uh, from northern England, we have uh, Cheshire cheese, which is a uh, cow's milk cheese. And there is white Cheshire, and there's also red Cheshire, which are essentially the same cheese, except that uh, anato is added to the latter. And what is anato, you may ask? Anato is an orange uh, red condiment and food coloring derives from the seeds of from the trees of the achiote tree native to Mexico. Some of this Cheshire cheese is allowed to develop blue mold, in uh, which case it is known as uh, blue Cheshire. Blue Shropshire, a cheese created in the late 70s, is of the same type. Uh, Cheshire cheese is produced in cylinders. The traditional size uh, was about 22 centimeters diameter by 26 centimeters high. 
but uh, weights now range from uh, 500 grams to 25 kilograms. Block cheese cheese is also produced, obviously a similar taste and texture, but uh, in blocks. And the color is usually white, as we said, a very pale cream color. The flavor is uh, salty, crumbly, and moist. And of course, if it's blue, it develops a sharper flavor with a, a nutty aftertaste. Mythologically and uh, you know, folklore-wise, we can trace Cheshire Cheese's history quite far in the past, or allegedly, you know, since uh, the Romans. But uh, Cheshire is one of, of a family of cheeses from West Cheshire and the bordering parts of Wales and Shropshire. One factor which contributed to its distinctiveness is that the area is located on salt-bearing rock strata, and so this is said to lend a special flavour to the milk of the cattle which graze there. And the mild, damp climate is ideal for pasture, which promotes high milk yields. So, there is a speculation that cheese was made in northwest prior to the Roman conquest, and that the cow's milk was used from an early date. There is also a mention in Domesday book in 1087 about cheese from no- from the northwest, and there are many early references from the late 16th and early 17th centuries uh, to cheese from this specific uh, region. So the basic craft method used for making Cheshire cheese was established by the 18th century. A complex finishing process was followed, including repeated skewerings, pressings, turnings, and rebandaging in progressively finer grades of cloth, plus external salting. Finally, the cheeses were stored in a room designed to maintain a high ambient temperature with a carpeting of sedge, hay or straw. Production of Cheshire flourished. Some farmers used a cooperative system, contributing milk to a communal dairy, a custom which continued until the 1950s. Cheese fairs were held in several major towns. Construction of canals encouraged the export of Cheshire to other parts of the country, notably the Midlands and Yorkshire, as well as the large cities closer to home, Liverpool and Manchester. During the late 800s, competition for farmhouse cheeses came from the industrial producers. The supply of expanding markets with raw milk also diverted their attention away from cheese. Farmhouse production continued, but fell throughout the first half of the last century. Of course, we have the dreaded 1939-1945, where the Ministry of Food encouraged a harder, drier version of the cheese, and the number of farmhouse makers declined further. However, the modern method for making cylindrical farmhouse Cheshire cheese is essentially that used in the 18th century. Only the finishing has changed, many now dipping the cheeses in wax after bandaging. The phenomenon of blue veining in Cheshire was locally known as green fade. It was discouraged in previous centuries, although the moist, loose texture curd and the finishing process must both have promoted mold growth. However, green fade cheeses were thrown away or kept for, for medicinal use to be applied externally to wounds and sores. In the late 19th century and early 20th centuries, green fade became more widely appreciated. Research was undertaken to investigate which cheeses blew the best. In the 1960s, a recipe was developed with the explicit aim of producing blue Cheshire. Lancashire cheese. This is a pressed cow's milk cheese made in two sizes either with a diameter of about 30 cm weighing about 23 kg or a diameter of uh, 16 cm about 12 cm high weighing approximately 5.5 kg. The traditional shape is a tall cylinder. The color a cream pale creamy yellow. It's creamy in texture. The flavor varies from uh, mild to strong depending on age. Lancashire cheese uh, became a distinct style made in the center of the county by the 18th century. The traditional method is complex and time-consuming, requiring curd made on one day to be divided and mixed with with that made the day before or the day after. This allows sufficient acidity to develop. So according to to Lowe's Grocer's Manual, circa 1895, portions of curd were sometimes kept for four or five days. Starter cultures were not introduced until the 20th century and were only used in very small proportions. The finest creamery Lancashire appeared early last century. Farmhouse cheese making survived until the 39-45 period of the previous century, but ceased because of the regulations about the use of milk for specific cheeses. It was revived on a limited scale in the late 40s, and by the 1970s, a handful of farms were producing it traditionally in the area. Lancashire is fragile. Almost all is produced around Preston, 
chipping and gas tank. It does not travel well and there is a strong preference for it on its home ground. The slowness and complexity of the method have inhibited creamery production. A block version was criticized by Patrick Rance in 1982, who commented on the recent abuse of the name. The real Lancashire was and remains a semi-soft, loose-textured, crumbly, buttery cheese, unlike any other flavor and resembling only the softer Dale's cheeses in consistency. It retains a strong regional identity. It can be eaten alone, but it's excellent for cooking, especially toasting. In the past, a sage-flavored Lancashire was made for Christmas. Beacon Fell traditional Lancashire cheese was awarded a PDO status. Ripplesdale cheese. This is a pressed, pasteurized milk cheese from cows, goats and sheep. Uh, not together, but uh, there are different versions made. It's plain, they're smoked or with garlic. The weight uh, for the sheep's milk cheese is about 1.25 kilo, goat 1.7 and cow 2 kilograms. The form is uh, of flat wheels and the color almost white. The flavor firm, nutty and mild. Ribblesdale, on the west of the Pennines, probably shared the general cheese-making tradition of the Dales. The area has long been known for mild-pressed cheeses. Both sheep and cow milk types are recorded. No documentary evidence for cheese-making in the Dale has been found, but artifacts such as a stone weight from a pressed asses farm indicate that it was made there in the past. The modern cheese was evolved by the Hill family using Wellesley Day recipes during the early 1980s. The milk for the goat and cow cheeses comes from local suppliers. The sips is from further afield. It is curdled with starter, followed by the vegetable rennet. The curd is always cut, but the particle size depends on the qualities of the milk from season to season. The curd is then scalded and salted before milling. The curd is filed into a mold and pressed for 48 to 72 hours. Maturation is 3 to 12 weeks. The cheeses are wax dipped early in the maturing process. Today's episode, it comes with the welcome support of Malby and Greek, the number one delicatessen, supplier and distributor of premium Greek produce from all the wild corners of Greece and with products from small artisanal producers. So why not try today some of the Malby and Greek's amazing early harvest extra virgin olive oil, their own one, which I find fantastically delicious, and um, some six month barrel aged feta cheese from uh, Costarellos and uh, some of the double baked barley rusts from Kithira and of course the wild Cretan oregano. Very few ingredients, very simple ingredients but together the combination is exquisite. So what I do is take a barley rusk, put a bit of feta cheese, drizzle with a bit of olive oil and I sprinkle it with a bit of oregano and this is Simple yet super delicious starter for anyone. Anyone will eat it and enjoy it. This is something I swear by. Try it and you won't regret it. Malbin Greek, the one-stop shop for your Greek fix. You can buy the exquisite goods online at malbiandgreek.com or if you go to the shop in Bermondsey, Lucy Way. And of course, for you, dear listeners, there is a 15% discount if you buy online with the code DELICIOUS. Enjoy! Another interesting um, food uh, stuffs from the north is uh, pressed beef. And this is pieces of cooked beef set in a dark brown jelly, thinly sliced, about 5 mm thickness, and sold by weight. So the history of this is similar to the concept of brawn, and like brawn, it probably began as something larger, more elaborate and more esteemed. The origins may lie in uh, coloring, a way of preserving large boned joints by brining and spicing then rolling tightly into a cloth, tied with a tape or string before boiling slowly. The meat could be preserved still longer if it were then potted under a layer of melted suet. Early recipes for fine dishes of well-seasoned beef joints in jelly may also have influenced the development of this dish. By the mid-19th century, coloring was no longer fashionable, but jellied meats pressed into molds and served cold much as pressed tongue, another English favorite, had entered the repertoire of those cooked meat counters as a way of using some of the less sellable cuts. Dalton's meat recipes, published in the 1930s, describes several products of the pressed beef type of varying degrees of sophistication. Mabe 
1978 found the quantity and variety of cooked meats available in the industrial towns of Lancashire remarkable, mentioning amongst other items various types of pressed meat in slices or molds, beef, pork, lamb, chicken. They are put into sandwiches, wedged into rolls, bubs and barm cakes, or set out on plates for high tea. Pressed beef may use cheaper cuts from the forequarter, especially the brisket, which have excellent flavor, but are not prime roasting material. The meat is covered with water and seasoned. Old recipes call for the addition of cow heels. The whole thing is cooked gently for up to three hours, any bones removed, and the meat put into a pudding basin. At this stage, if no cow heel was used, some butchers add gelatin to the stock poured over the meat. It is cooled, then pressed and the stock sets to a jelly. Cumberland Rum Niki This is a circular tart, which is now also baked in long oblongs, with a decorative pastry lattice on top. The color is a golden crust with a dark, rich brown filling. The flavor is rich, soft filling with spices and rum. So the history of uh, Rum Niki contains elements present in the British cookery for many centuries. Rum, the vital ingredient, has been imported from the West Indies into ports on the Cambrian coast for at least 200 years. The filling contains dates and preserved ginger. It bears some resemblance to the combination of spice and dried fruit known as mincemeat, but also to mixtures proposed in 16th century cookery books, such as one from 1587 of prunes with breadcrumbs, claret, ginger and sugar. Earlier last century, it was the form of the dish rather than the filling which distinguished it. In the 1930s, Mrs. Arthur Webb recorded visiting a Lake District farmhouse on a day when Nikki's were being baked. She recorded that they were of several sorts, including some sounding very like mince pies or eccles cakes. Some were made with dough and some with sour crust. The local method was to leave the edge plain, but make cuts or nicks to and fro across the top. As the present-day tart always involves the decoration of pastry trellis, it would seem that this, rather than the rum filling, is what gave the dish its identity. Several small bakeries continue to manufacture it. One at least has a large mail-order business at Christmas time. Uh, recently collected examples of uh, these recipes uh, use either salt crust or puff pastry rolled to fill a shallow dish. The filling is chopped dates, preserved ginger, butter, sugar and rum. This is baked in 220 degrees Celsius in the oven for 10-15 minutes and followed by 30 minutes at 100 degrees Celsius. Taylor's Original Prepared English Mustard Taylor's Original is a smooth paste, the color yellow with an ochre tone, very salty, aromatic, mildly pungent with a slight bitter undertone. This is a mustard made in Britain of course with a long history and the plant the mustard plant was probably introduced by the Romans and is often mentioned in English texts about food from the Middle Ages onwards. Over the centuries, methods for making mustard evolved and the location of the industry moved several times. In the 16th and 17th century, Tewkesbury mustard from Gloucestershire was the most famous. It was coarse and included much horseradish. It was compacted into balls which were dried and sent around the country. Users could reconstitute it with wine, vinegar, water. Sir Hugh Platt, 1602, noticed that in Venice the mustard seed was ground much more finely, as if it were wheat flour. It could be sold ready to be mixed into a condiment. He suggested the idea to be adapted in Britain. Eventually this happened, although it took another hundred years. The invention is attributed to one Mrs. Clements of Durham, who began to grind and sift the seed as Platt advised. She sold the powder all over the country in the early 18th century. In 1830s, William Taylor, an apothecary in Newport Pagnell, Buckinghamshire, devised a method for making a ready-mixed mustard paste, which had excellent flavor and keeping qualities. Taylor never milled mustard flour. He bought his supplies and the product relies on a specific blend of flours, a unique method of mixing and the use of salt as a preservative. The formula was preserved in his recipe book and is the first known example of a ready-prepared smooth English mustard. Originally, stone were jars, corked and sealed with wax were used as containers, but now they are glass. The present owners of Taylor's, Ross Southwell, speculates the product's success have, may have stemmed from its keeping qualities. It was popular with naval officers, who included it in their private stores. The salty paste, well sealed, resisted damage from seawater and damp conditions. The company founded by William Taylor 
diversified into soft drinks, as did many former apothecaries, and this side became the most important. However, by the 1970s, it was unable to resist competition from larger businesses and forced again to rely on mustard. In the late 1980s, the firm nearly went out of business, but was rescued as a result of a greater public awareness of uh, characterful British food produce and a greater vigour imparted by the new owner. Now the technique, the formula and the method are trade secrets. Mustard flowers are, are purchased, blended and mixed with water, wheat flour, salt and turmeric. This releases an enzyme and a glycoside, giving pungency. The mixture is heated using a temperature gradient sufficient to partly destroy the enzyme, or else the flavor is too harsh, but leaving enough undamaged to give character. Swaledale cheese. Pressed, pasteurized ewes and cow's milk cheeses, sold in weights of 250 grams, 500 grams, 2 kilograms, 3 kilograms, and 1.5 for flavoured cow's milk cheeses. The form is small truckles. The colour is very pale cream. The flavour is fresh, lemony and buttery. The cow's milk cheeses are available smoked or flavoured with chives and garlic, apple mint or soaked in old peculiar ale. The Swale Dale cheese belongs to the Dale's group of small, sharp flavoured, softish cheeses. Back when most of the land about there was owned by the Cistercian Monastery of Servaux, the valleys were farmed from the granges, which are, which are outlying cells that managed the vast flocks of sheep that um, were roaming around England. Uh, back then, England's wool was the best in Europe. Cheeses were made in great number. The monastery could get through tons every year. Many of them were from sheep's milk. The skills first refined by the monks and their laborers spread to the community at large. And we today are their inheritors, thankfully. Swelldale cheese pursued much the same course as Wensleydale and suffered as badly when everything was centralized. Swelldale cheese is now produced in moderately large quantities by a creamer in the valley. The cow's milk cheeses are available all year. Those made with sheep's milk tend to be seasonal from January until late autumn. Protected designation of origin has been granted to both sheep's milk and cow's milk versions. A recipe for Swelldale cheese, still used in the 1980s, was recorded by Patrick Rance. The milk was taken straight from the cow and rennetted without the addition of starter at 32 degrees Celsius and left for an hour. The curd was broken into fine pieces and left for an hour, then the whey was poured off. The curd was put into muslin and hung up to drip for 12 hours. The curd was crumbled fine by hand, salted and mixed and turned into fine muslin. It was then moulded and pressed for at least 12 hours. On removal from the press, the cheese was unmoulded, the cloth removed and the cheeses stored in a cool place, turned daily for 3 weeks for soft or up to several months for the drier crumbly cheese. The milk comes from specific herds and flocks in Swirledale. It is pasteurised before use. Exact details of the methods are not disclosed. Swirledale is based on a similar recipe to Wensleydale and both use cow's milk and sheep's milk. The cheeses are lightly pressed and salted by brining after removal of the moulds. And that's it! Thanks for listening. I've been Thomas Dinas, and this was the Delicious Legacy Podcast. So please do drop us uh, those five-star reviews on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and wherever else you get your podcasts from, because uh, this helps others who love food and history to find our podcasts. If you enjoy this podcast, you can help it keep going by backing it up on the crowdfunder platform Patreon. Search the Delicious Legacy Podcast Patreon to find out how to get the show early and without ads. Many thanks to all my Patreon backers so far. Your support is much, much appreciated. Remember to share this podcast with three friends of yours. That will help uh, grow and make it more well-known. Thanks for listening. All the best over and out.